My main focus on this is I'm a music fan. I'm not a person who wanted to be a recording person. I'm not a person who wanted to play music. I'm a person that wanted to put something back into this thing that I'm super excited about, which is music. And so as a music fan along the way, you know, if you're really voracious like that, like most musicians hopefully are, you find some things that really, really resonate with you. My name is Larry Crane. I am the founder and editor of Tape Pop Magazine. I'm the owner of Jackpot Recording Studio in Portland, Oregon. I moved up into Portland in 1993, and I've been playing in a band for a long time. And um, I was really always involved in the recording process quite a bit. And I was like, I need to learn more. Like I didn't know how to set a, a preamp level for a microphone or anything like that. And so I started going to the library and reading all the books I could find. And I would go to Powell's Books, which is a famous bookstore here. And I'd buy all the magazines about music recording. And that wasn't really quite always hitting the right points for me, all of it. I, I found I still had to contact old friends and ask them a few questions about making records and engineering. And so I kind of got this idea that someone could do a magazine that focused on sort of the underground way of making records and doing records on a budget and things like that. I would look at other magazines and they would have big, huge consoles on the cover and big rooms full of nice wood floors and stuff. And I'd never made a record in a studio like that. And I thought that's, that's nice, but that's very different from my reality. And I had been a, a writer for a lot of zines, like uh, underground magazines writing about music. And all those magazines all folded at the same time in the early 90s. And everything just kind of lined up to where I thought, why don't I just start a cool little zine about music recording? Uh, so the first you know, handful of issues were really just completely like hand assembled. Uh, the first cover, for the first issue, I spray painted all the covers on my front porch, and uh, that was a little too much extra work, so I stopped doing it after that, and I just started buying colored paper. And then I started taking it to a printer and getting actual uh, a printer to like, you know, make the copies. I got to go pick up boxes of magazines, which is a lot better than stapling them. And um, you know, I would call people, I would interview them, I'd transcribe it. And once the first couple of issues came out, people would say, I could interview someone or I got an article I want to write. And, you know, a small group of people started kind of forming around it and de donating, you know, basically donating articles to the cause. And, um, you know, it, it attracted its own little crowd. And one of the things I was really good at is I, I actually worked at a record distributor at the time. so. We'd throw, you know, we'd throw a tape op in the box to a record store. And I also knew a lot of people in bands and record labels and studios. And I would just mail copies for free to them. Um, you know, people like, uh, you know, Matador Records and stuff I'd already had dealings with. So I would send them copies and they were like, oh, we'll run some ads in there or, or uh, Discord Records and Fugazi and people like that. We would just keep in touch. and. And, uh, you know, I was just part of that scene, you know, so it was a nice grassroots way to, to build something up and, and talk about the people that, that we knew that were making records and, and just kind of open up the horizons of what tape pop could cover. My friend, John Bacigalupi, um, he loved the magazine. I would send it to him and he had an opportunity. He was publishing another magazine called Heckler. And he had a staff going and they were like, if we bring in another magazine to add on to Heckler, we can keep the staff busy full time. So uh, we had a meeting up here and they decided to do that. Uh, and, and so around issue 11, he joined the team. And that issue was the first one with, uh, with John's involvement as really the publisher, doing the layout, selling the ads, uh, overseeing the printing and distribution. And I was, I'm, my role has always been more generating the content, you know, overseeing the editorial. Although we, we cross paths quite a bit on that stuff. We, we confer over everything. Uh, so John, uh, there was a publishing company and then John ended up being the only one left. <laughs> so really it's, it's become, you know, me and John uh, Bocciglupi as the co-owners of Tape Op. 
and um, it's been great. He's the best business partner anyone could ever have, and he really has the same vision I have for it. And and that's what, like that was a leap. At issue 11, we went from 2,500 copies to 25,000 copies, and we went from you know really thin to a lot more pages, and we went to a lot more ads to help cover the cost. Of, of printing and distributing the magazine. And that's where it's gone since. Like the advertising is what allows Tape Op to be distributed free in the United States as a, as a print magazine. And now of course it's a PDF magazine that you can get anywhere in the world for free. And now we're at a point where it's the largest distribution or largest circulation of any recording magazine in the world. And it's just owned by these two dudes that, you know, used to make records together. This free subscription model, we just made it public, honestly, and, we, and I think it's worked really, really well because a lot of our readers, as, as we find out, are, are younger, like recording students or even high school students will tell me they read it in high school and it inspired them. And you know, when you're, when you're younger and you're, you're a student or you're just getting by, you don't have extra money. So it makes for a great way to get the content out there and get their eyeballs on it and that helps us do it. It's just a kind of a loop, a cycle of that. There's, there's, there's several rules, um, and the unwritten rules of tape op. I don't know if I should give them away, but one of them is, the, is to not feature the artist on the cover or, or the lead story. Like we've only broken that rule in very subtle ways and, and if readers want to go back and look, they can figure that out. But um, General of the idea is that the front cover has, has kind of something artistic, whether it's a photo or actual works of art, um, something that someone is, uh, has painted for us and allowed us to use. And, and then John uh, Bocciglupi, my partner, does all the layout uh, along with Scott McShane, who's like his assistant on that end of it, um, like pre-press assistant, really. And, um, there's certain, you know, we've been, ever since John's come aboard, we've used some of the same certain fonts, typefaces, and layout schemes. The front cover, the, the uh, black stripe on the left, and the image on the right, and the font that the tape op name is in, were all actually initially designed by a, a really uh, dear friend who I haven't seen in ages named Sean Tetrarachi. And uh, he's gone on to do all kinds of album covers and things over the years, posters. Uh, book design, book cover design. So uh, that that format, John really liked that and adopted that into his own way of layout. And you know, it's just a certain thing. Um, like I think it was about a year ago, we decided to go with a different paper stock, and then people have been really favorable to that. We have a a matte finish now. We also have a perfect bound edge, as, as opposed to a staple. And um, I like that because it feels a little bit more like a boutique artifact to me and and that that changing that perception of tape op from like a trade journal to more of like a uh, something you keep around and put on the bookshelf is is important to us because people do hang on to these magazines and they and they do cherish them and they buy back issues so the more having more permanence to the to the vibe of it and a little more weight to it feels good even to the lowest points where I was like, God, I gotta put another issue together. It's still far more interesting than any other job I ever had, you know? I mean, that and producing records are the, my two favorite things. So, you know, being able to put this content together, put it out there in the world, to have people care about it, to get, you know, really nice emails or comments from people all over the world, it's it's really important to me and it, it really does sustain it in a way. And and the fact that I can make part of my living from it is just incredible. So it's not even hard to keep doing tape op. It's gonna be hard to stop doing tape op in 15 years when I'm 70 years old. I mean, I don't know. You know, we, I think tape op at its best is some, a magazine that can help someone be creative, but also turn them on to other creative music. And I think that we're seeing more and more of that happening and it's really exciting, you know? it's. Uh, uh, as long as it had something to people's lives, I think we're doing great. <laughs>